So we're now going to have a debate. Uh, I think there's been lots of references to referendums. This is another yes-no uh, debate. And this is about medical expulsive therapy. Uh, we have two distinguished speakers. They seem to share a love of uh, food and fishing, but not of whether you should use medical expulsive therapy. There'll be a question at the end. So if anyone um, doesn't have the app for voting, if you can do that while we're discussing uh, this question, and then we'll ask you to vote at the end. So if I um, just tell you a little bit about both speakers, and then they'll come up and speak one after the other, and then there'll be some time at the end without any slides for them to come back at each other if they want to clarify any points. So we're very fortunate to have um, John Hollingsworth, who's an associate professor from the University of Michigan in America, and he's um, advocating medical expulsive therapy. He's um, received a Urology Foundation Rising Star Career Award, and he runs a successful research program into um, stone disease and studying it particularly at a population level. He also has a reputation for seeking out Michelin-starred restaurants. So I was slightly embarrassed to find that one of my colleagues took him to a curry house last night, but he says he enjoyed it very much. Sam McClinton, who um, sadly is uh, retiring from clinical practice, but fortunately for us is going to continue with his research interests, which I was very relieved to hear. He's obviously done a great job in this country of setting up multi-centre trials. It won't surprise most of you to know that he's debating against the motion. <clears throat> so if I ask the first speaker to stand up. Well, thanks for the opportunity to come uh, speak at BAUS. Uh, it's really an honor, and um, everybody's been very hospitable. Um, I was out last night with uh, Jonathan and Matt and Oliver, uh, and I had a great time. So uh, thank you so much. This is a bit of an uphill battle for me. I know that. Um, I just have to figure out how to use the uh, clicker here. Um, so I do have some disclosures. I received some grant funding from the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan, as well as um, the Urology Care Foundation. <clears throat> so th this is the, the patient that we're all talking about today. This gentleman um, is showing up in your clinic, and you do some imaging, and you find that he has a six millimeter stone. <clears throat> and so the, the question that we have for everyone today is, um, will we offer him a trial of an alpha blocker? Yes or no? Um, just by a show of hands, so I know how big of a hole I have to climb out of, who would offer him an alpha blocker? Great. So uh, I thought it would be a deeper hole. <laughs> so um, just to begin, uh, everyone's familiar with the EUA's uh, guidelines on urolithiasis. And so prior to uh, Sam's uh, Lancet study, uh, the recommendations were to offer a patient like this a trial of an alpha blocker or a calcium channel blocker. And that was based off of level 1A um, evidence, um, which showed that patients uh, who were offered a trial of an alpha blocker had a higher risk of spontaneous stone passage. And then that, that was the world view. And then in May of 2015, uh, Sam study turned things upside down for um, alpha blockers. <clears throat> so everybody in the audience is very familiar with um, Sam's um, excellent work. This is um, uh, the study that was published in The Lancet, and I won't go into the details of that because I have a feeling that he'll be referencing it greatly uh, during his rebuttal. Um, but in, in essence, um, what uh, the multi-site study uh, had showed was that expulsive therapy versus placebo offered no benefit when you took all comers with ureteral calculi. And this was true when looking at tamsulosin versus placebo, nifedipine versus placebo, or either versus placebo. And so at the um, end of uh, the study, uh, one of the comments from Sam and his co-authors was that our trial suggests that these drugs should not be offered to patients with uh, ureteral colic managed expectantly, giving providers of healthcare an opportunity to reallocate resources elsewhere. And so, you know, when I read that statement, I, I thought, you know, this, um, you know, thinking, well, what about, you know, the other, the data from the 52 other studies? <clears throat> and, you know, more importantly, digging a little bit deeper into um, Sam's study, you know, th there appeared to be some trends towards uh, significance with respect to 
uh, larger stones as well as stones located in the distal ureter. And you know, to me, this, this makes a lot of intuitive, intuitive sense. There is some face validity there. Namely, you know, with smaller stones, you've practically won the battle. But perhaps with the larger stones, there may be a benefit. And with regards to location within the ureter, uh, there's a concentration of those alpha adrenergic receptors within the distal ureter, although they're located throughout the length of the ureter. So perhaps you know, the, the patients with the more distal stones may benefit from it um, if there is a benefit with it. And so my, my thought was maybe we shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater, and maybe there are some patients who could potentially still benefit from um, explosive therapy. And so with that, we did another meta-analysis, um, and we identified 53 studies, uh, including uh, Sam's excellent work, that looked at uses of alpha blockers for patients with ureteral calculus disease. <clears throat> So in the 53 studies, there were a total of uh, 50, roughly 5,700 patients that were randomized. Um, these are some descriptive statistics looking at mean age in the treatment and control populations as well as average stone size, showing that there is uh, roughly equivalence between the two groups. And then th this is something that I want to come back to a little bit later. This was looking at uh, the studies um, from, based off of country of origin and looking at the passage rate in the control group in those um, countries. And one thing I wanted to point out here, and I think that this is, this is an important point, in, um, in, and this is not meant to be critical of the, of the UK study, but if, if you look, the, the rate of spontaneous stone passage in the control group was around 80%, and that second highest um, only compared to uh, studies from Australia where the rate of spontaneous passage was up to 82%. And that's something that we have to keep in mind when interpreting um, the data. So this slide, which you probably can't read from, from the back, shows uh, the results of our main analysis where we pooled data using random effects models. <clears throat> and we, we found, uh, including SAMS as well as other studies that have been published since, that the pooled risk ratio is around uh, 1.50, implying a 50% higher risk of spontaneous passage uh, when patients receive uh, explosive therapy or specifically an alpha blocker. And the pooled risk difference was around 27%, uh, implying that one in four patients receive benefit for every uh, four patients treated. Now, th this is a cumulative meta-analysis where we basically looked at stability in the effect size uh, with every subsequent study that was published. And what you can see in this forest plot here is that there's been roughly a stable effect size since around 2006. So with all of these subsequent studies that have been done, including some large studies like SAMS that showed no benefit, the, the effect size really hasn't moved much. <clears throat> and one of the things that Sam will critique um, the prior studies and some of the ones that have come out since on has to do with the quality of, of the studies that have been published on explosive therapy. And it's true, there, there's a dictum in meta-analysis, as most of you are aware, garbage in equals garbage out. So we did a, vi a variety of sensitivity analyses to kind of test the robustness of our findings. You know, we looked at excluding those studies which didn't use placebo controls, because that's been a criticism of many of those studies. Um, and we found that there was some attenuation of the effect size, but it was still significant. Uh, we looked at studies um, excluding uh, those where there was co-administration of corticosteroids, which is not a very common practice in the States, but there are some European countries which still prescribe, and we, we found that the effect size was stable. Uh, we also looked at excluding those um, studies which were just published in abstract form, perhaps at the World Congress or the EAU or the um, AUA's national meetings, and again, uh, we, we found some persistence of, of effect. <clears throat> now. Clearly, a lot of the studies that have been published have not been as methodologically rigorous as um, SAM's study, and th this is the Cochrane uh, Collaborations tool for the assessment of risk of bias in studies, <clears throat> and it's kind of highlighting some of the heterogeneity in study quality. And what we did here was we basically eliminated those studies where there was a high risk of bias and looked only at those with moderate to low risk. Again, we saw some attenuation in the effect size, down to 31% increased risk, but still some persistence. So the, 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 there seems to be a signal, and this is looking at um, all stones, regardless of lo uh, location within the ureter. Um, and here, again, I want to get back to this idea of baseline risk. What we've done in this particular force plot is we've divided uh, patients into uh, different groups, or studies into different groups based off of the baseline risk. In the top group, we have uh, patients where, or studies where the, the control group had a less than 40 percent uh, rate of spontaneous passage. In the middle part of the forest plot, we have those uh, studies where the baseline risk was between 40 and 60 percent. And then in the bottom, what you see are those uh, pooled studies where the 
uh, risk was uh, above 60%, which would include SAM study. And you see that there is some attenuation based off of the baseline risk. But even in that highest uh, passage group, you can still see some um, significant effect associated with expulsive therapy. We also regressed uh, the, the log of or the risk of spontaneous uh, passage on baseline risk, and that's shown here in this plot. And what you can see is that for every 10% increase in the baseline risk, that the relative risk of stone passage decreases by roughly 13%. So I think that this is just something to keep in mind when we're looking at studies like SAMS. We did dig a little bit deeper looking at uh, the effect of stone size. And consistent with um, SAMS findings, there, there appeared to be a um, little benefit to those patients who had smaller uh, uh, ureteral stones, <clears throat> uh, whereas those with larger stones, uh, there, there was about a 57% higher risk of, of passage. Um, unlike SAM, we didn't see an effect, though, based off of stone location. So for both distal stones, which the majority of the studies included in our analysis were focusing primarily on distal stones, there were also some studies that considered upper and middle uh, ureteral stones. Um, and we, we found that for both upper and mid ureteral stones as well as distal stones, there appeared to be some benefit associated with expulsive therapy. So in, in, in addition to our primary outcome, we considered some secondary outcomes that may be of importance to patients, including things like time to stone passage, which is somewhat problematic uh, given that when you're asking a patient, you know, how many days does it take for you to pass the stone, there can be some recall bias. <coughs> uh, we looked at the rates of surgical intervention, hospitalization, uh, number of pain episodes reported by the patient, uh, as, as well as the occurrence of serious adverse effects. And we, we saw that in general, explosive therapy is well tolerated. Uh, the only um, adverse effect that we saw to be significantly associated with explosive therapy use was ejaculatory dysfunction uh, and offered a lot of other benefits uh, to patients. So given this, the, these data, uh, the American Neurologic Association as a part of their revised guidelines on ureteral stone still does recommend a trial of expulsive therapy for patients uh, with ureteral stones a, a, mil, a centimeter in size or smaller. So getting back to the, the question that I posed at the beginning, should we offer this patient a trial of an alpha blocker? I believe the US view is yes. And so with that, um, I realize I'm in the lion's den. I, I turn the uh, debate over to my esteemed colleague. Thank you. Well, I think the first thing I'm going to say is I am really disappointed by that show of hands. Um, I can't believe you people are still giving these drugs to people uh, without good evidence. So let me tell you why you shouldn't be using them. Is, is evidence important? Well, yes, it is important. Um, you know, you've got to believe what the evidence tells you, and you can't just take out of evidence what you would like to take out of evidence. So you have to actually have good evidence that you can use. John uh, was one of the first to do a meta-analysis looking at the use of um, alpha blockers way back in, in 2006, I think. And at that time, uh, they showed a, a very big effect. And there have been numerous uh, meta-analyses since. There have been dozens of meta-analysis of exactly the same data. We didn't believe it, so we went to the HCA and said, can we do a study uh, to properly answer this question? And we got funding to do suspend, which many of you were good enough to recruit patients into. It was a proper multi-center, randomized, placebo-controlled trial with large numbers much larger than any other study. 24 centers, over a thousand participants, a very high quality trial, but pragmatic because it's an NHS trial, so it has to be relevant to the NHS and to NHS practice. So our endpoint was different to the endpoints that have been used in other studies. And that has caused us some problems. John's already shown you some of this. Here's the data from the study. Very clear outcome, no difference between the arms. Doesn't matter where the stone is. And that trend 
for larger stones was really a very small trend and not statistically significant at all. And that's the same forest plot. Forest plots are great things because on a forest plot, you can put an arrow that says it's this way or that way. But actually, what you should be looking at is what is the heterogeneity of that data? What is that data really telling you? And that's what our take on the meta-analysis was. We thought it was a sound, methodologically large, and that these drugs were unlikely to be useful in clinical practice. You may say these are safe drugs, uh, they're cheap, <coughs> so why not give them to patients? And I think one of the best comments I heard about that was actually from Ollie, which was, why not give them M&Ms? They taste better, and they probably do just about the same. This is from family practice in the UK. Uh, they do what they call pearls. They take evidence and they make recommendations to our general practitioners. And this is what they told general practitioners in the UK, don't use these drugs, and it's based on very good evidence. The AUA, however, um, based on some data from, from John and Philip Dam and others, uh, have said, no, you should continue to use this because, and, and the commentary in, in the, the AUA guidelines is quite interesting. Although this was a well-designed study, um, much larger than any others, and it raises some concern, it's not necessarily comparable uh, because the outcome is different. Well, what, what was different about the outcome? The, the thing that worried them was the fact that our intervention rates, and, and John's alluded to this, were much more spontaneous passage. In fact, this is spontaneous passage at four weeks was the, the primary outcome. When you looked at it at 12 weeks, it's actually down to about 73%. And if you ask the statistician, they'll tell you that that is within what they call a, a credible limit. It's not an outlier. Uh, and it's not a, an issue in terms of an outcome that you shouldn't pay attention to. This is the latest meta-analysis uh, based, based on 50-odd studies now. If you look back to a sites review back in 2009, the spontaneous stone passage rate was around about 50%, and that's the kind of figure that's still quoted. But when you look at the, the time the stone passes between different studies, it's hugely different depending on what study you look at. And you really shouldn't expect that. You know, between different countries, do we really think that stones pass differently in Thailand or Korea or the UK? Is the ureter different between countries? I suspect not. So I think this heterogeneity is unbelievable. The latest Cochrane review was done just two years ago, and they made a number of comments. And these still apply, even if you take the 52 studies. They're all single center, small groups, and the methodological strength of these studies is really very poor. And the primary endpoints, end points, which are what concern people, uh, with the fact that we had need for further intervention. The primary point points are stone-free rate, um, but that's only assessed by CT in very few studies. So stone-free rate based on patient recollection. I think patient recollection is really biased um, and very unreliable. So what does it change? What does it take? What, about, what is it going to do? What do I need to do to make you stop putting your hands up when people say, are you going to give tamsulosin? So how good is the evidence? So before suspend, what, what was the evidence like? It, is it better than the, the evidence from suspend? Suspend was a really very strong, pragmatic trial. And the need for intervention is actually a much more reliable outcome than stone free rate. It's much easier to measure. 
you know for sure whether somebody has had an intervention or not, uh, and you don't need any imaging to conclude that. So, what do I think? I think our clinical practice so far has been driven by very small RCTs and driven then by the conclusion of the RCTs put together into a meta-analysis. We have not been critical enough of that evidence and we have not been critical enough of both the quality and the reliability of that evidence. And that evidence is at best extremely weak and at worst frankly misleading. So from my perspective, stop using alpha blockers. They don't work. Thank you. I don't, I don't have a prepared rebuttal uh, for uh, Sam's comments, but um, I would just say that um, I think that there are um, lessons that can be taken away from the suspend trial without abandoning it completely, um, namely that um, the, the uh, meta-analysis that we did, uh, which I'm, I'm sure Sam's grimacing about, uh, where we looked at these subgroups did, did show that there are uh, some patients for whom explosive therapy clearly doesn't uh, appear to play uh, much of a role, and that would be the, the smaller ureteral stone. However, for those with um, larger stones, um, regardless of location, I, I would still advocate uh, for its use. I do think that you know, there are some um, questions about implementing a strategy like that with your emergency department. Um, how do you get the emergency medicine physician to distinguish between what is large and what is uh, small? Uh, we use a, a cutoff of five millimeters an hour. Uh, but I, I would agree with Sam that we probably shouldn't be prescribing this to, to everyone, but it does have some salutary benefits in terms of uh, pain uh, reduction and uh, pain episodes based off of the meta-analysis. Not true, though, in uh, Sam's study. Yeah, I, I think that's because the British are much more stoical than, than the Americans, I suspect. No, 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 no. So we'll see if we, see if we can get you to vote. So the question you're voting on is if you, now having heard both sides of the debate, if you saw a 27-year-old with a six millimeter ureteric stone, would you prescribe um, medical expulsive therapy, yes or no? Sorry, it's not up on here. Which one's which? Which, which? which is blue and which is red? <laughs> <laughs> Can uh, someone at the back direct us which colour's which? Oh, okay. So yes is so there are three different screens with three different bits of information. I apologise <laughs> for that. So red is yes, and blue is no. So it seems like the home team of taken the debate. Thank you. I think we need to do another mess now. <laughs> <laughs>